Okay, we're going to get started. Uh, I'll unmute. Hello, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Apologies for the difficulties. We're still having some issues, so we're connected on our personal laptops. Um, so hello, everybody online. Um, welcome to our quarterly meeting. Today is March 14th, um, and we'll start with roll call. Are you angry or should I just not gladly? Hey, this is Melissa. Can everyone hear me okay? Fantastic. Yep. Navigating to roll call. Thank you for your patience. Um, I almost have it memorized, but not quite. Uh, Zan Ogero. Uh, Eric Cardella. Parasa Chanrami. Here. Yoseline De La Garza. Here. All right. Thank you. Online, Jenny Glass. Here. Janine Hartley. Celeste Jansen, Robin Johnson, She's online. Sam Co, Kim Le, Here. Andy Leonard, Tabidi Lewis, Adrian Livingston, Here. Christina McMahon, Here. See you, Adrian. Thank you. But thank you for telling me the online folks. Yeah. Maricela Ortega Guzman. Here. Jeff Parker. Uh, present online. Carlos Rodriguez. Molly Rogers. Good morning. I'm here. Diana Rojas. Andy Santana May. Janelle Fiabald. Liz Thorne. Here. Good morning. PV Wilson. Liz, no, thank you. I will. I'll go yeah, back and check. Exactly. All right. That's the end of roll call back to you, Maricela or Brian. Thank you. I am muted. Is that all right? Okay. Um, just a reminder, this is a public meeting. Um, so please state your this is a recorded public meeting. So please state your name before speaking. Um, the first item on our agenda is we double check to make sure we have a quorum. I'll have to get back to you. Okay. Before, before, if we, before we have a vote. Thank you. Okay. Um, so RFA update. You want to just do the one? Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. This is a formal advisory meeting of the state. If you are a member of the public and wish to make a comment, there will be a public comment section at the end of the agenda. Um, the and members of the public have three minutes to speak per person. If you would like to make a comment, please um, send a chat to Melissa um, so that we can make sure that we save some time for you at the end of the meeting. Hey, can people hear me? No, it's Brian. I'm unmuted. Thanks. I see thumbs up. I appreciate that. Because I think the best way, should I just? I can share. Do you want to share, mm -hmm. Melissa? Thanks. So we'll share for my piece. Um, looking at the agenda again, I know we're running behind. So just appreciate everybody's patience. I'm going to run us through a um, summary um, of the third party review of our request for application process. Um, so for folks in the room, I believe you have a hard copy of the PowerPoint. It's a big, thick, stapled <laughs> doc. For folks online, Melissa, what do they have anything? They have the PowerPoint. They and have the afterwards PowerPoint. The, afterwards, the materials will be available Good. And, on our website. Yeah. And so for those online, obviously, yes, yeah, so you're viewing the PowerPoint <laughs> as I go through it. So just wanted to make sure everybody knows what they have in front of them or beside them or wherever it might be. <laughs> um, all right, so we'll jump in because again, I know we're short on time. Next slide. 
Thanks, Melissa. Um, so just as a bit of background and context for those, you know, in our December meeting, we talked a bit about um, uh, about this topic, had some public comment as well. Um, so just again, quick reminders in 2022, um, uh, the then Governor Brown asked agencies to do community engagement around their budget um, and kind of other key initiatives. So we did a big community engagement effort and it really produced a lot of really great input and some strong interest in our grant making. Um, also want to just remind folks around the collaboration on our grant making practice that we work closely with the Department of Education uh, in their procurement office, the Department of Administrative Services and the Department of Justice um, around grant making and, and RFA development and um, execution. Um, the, the last um, competitive process was um, among the highest um, volume uh, historically, 400 plus applications for our youth grants. And that's youth grants are three different areas, our community investment initiative, our future ready grants and our re-engagement opportunity grants. We had um, over 240 individual um, organizations that applied, 80 plus reviewers, and then 29 review teams um, evaluating those um, applications. Um, the request for, um, for funding exceeded the available dollars that we had. So we had nearly 80 million in requests and about 30 million in funds available. Um, you can see the split um, in the different uh, area um, in different grant making initiatives. And then after that um, RFA process, we had meetings with about 25 unaward or, unawarded organizations to answer questions and gather feedback. We did receive, as was pointed out, um, a number of records requests, specific complaints, and feedback and public comment from four um, organizations and an individual. Um, at this point, 104 organizations are signing grant their grant agreements and moving forward with programming for youth and families. So things are moving um, out. Um, and so we're excited about that. Just want to say to appreciate all the input, feedback, any conversation we have today um, as it relates to our RFAs. And you'll see after I go through the review, some of the next steps and actions that we want to pursue. I'm going to move to the, or Melissa will move us to the next slide. <laughs> There we go. There we go. Thank you. So a uh, quick overview, the Oregon Department of Education asked a third party to conduct a review of youth development. Oregon referred to as youth development going forward on our request for applications, specifically around the community investment grants. Next slide. Um, the uh, here the this is an overview of the app of the review. I'll say, I think for those we will at the conclusion of this meeting, we will make this PowerPoint and the review itself available on the meeting materials on our website. Uh, so it'll be there in public and you can look at it more closely. Um, and I think folks in the room um, have a hard copy of the review itself. Um, so overview of the review. Reviewer did not find any, did not encounter any violations of the request for application. Um, the reviewer did identify several areas to improve. These are areas in which um, Youth Development Oregon and ODE Procurement um, could provide greater clarity about the application uh, review process and procedures. The review document outlines each area or allegation um, uh, as follows. There's a statement of the allegation. There's an expl or the explanation from Youth Development. Often those explanations are not just from us, but also from procurement. Um, discussion of any um, compliance or, um, um, and any pertinent materials related to that allegation. The identify, identification of opportunities for improvement. And I use that same outline in the slides that you're just about to see. Uh, the review does cover six um, areas or allegations, tabulation meetings, application assignment, application scoring, contact with the reviewer due to a disagreement, uh, the scoring rubric and protest process. So those are the areas that I'm gonna cover here. Any questions to this point um, from members of our council? I'll pause and because I know for folks who are online, you're looking at the, oh, yeah, you wanna go back one, yeah, sorry. Melissa? Because I know folks have this in, uh, in hand, but for those online, I'll try to give you a <laughs> few seconds to, to look and review. Um, all right, moving forward um, to the next one. 
Thank you. So this is the first area, um, tabulation meetings. I, you know, we I've gone back and forth about like whether I should read this to you or or what. So I'll just kind of hit some of the high points. But for those online, you're looking at it and you're welcome to review. For those in the room, you also have this in front of you. Um, um, I'll hit some of the key high points. Tabulation meetings were not held. Um, we've historically gone some some processes we use a tabulation meeting sometimes we don't a tabulation meeting is basically a chance for reviewers to come together and discuss their scores those meetings have happened um, when there's a discrepancy or difference between one reviewer gave us eight and then another gave a two why what how how did that come about why does why you know what what is the explanation we chose in this last process um, to not hold those those meetings. The next explanation ex does confirm that we did not hold the meetings. We understood from um, uh, ODE procurement that those meetings were optional. Um, um, the, in the RFA compliance line, right, we had brought up tabulation meetings in some of our training materials. Um, and the RFA specifically doesn't actually get into the details of tabulation meetings. It's more of a kind of a process at an operational level. Um, the opportunity for improvement. References to the to those uh, meetings did de did not designate whether they were optional or not, and so by use development should either follow the documented procedure or clarify that that in pertinent materials the tab tabulation meetings are indeed optional. I'll say that in our most recent request for um, application process around reengagement collabor collaborative grants collaboration grants collaborative collaborative, uh, collaborative grants, which is our latest RFA. Um, we did use tabulation meetings. So um, we're going to look at that process in the, in the, for the coming biennium. Um, sometimes we find those processes do impact outcomes. Sometimes somebody has a seven or somebody has an eight and somebody has a two, and then it goes from a seven to a three so that the total doesn't really change. So um, definitely something for us to look at. Any questions about that? I think folks online have had a chance to read. I'm going to ask Melissa to move us forward. Application assignment. Um, again, you, you're in the room, have a chance to read this closely. Again, this is, I like cut and pasted this stuff from the actual review. I did in many cases shorten, you know, didn't put every last sentence, but this is a summary, but you've got, um, you know, words that are straight from the review. Um, the app, um, assignment of applications to review teams was not conducted in a truly randomized manner. That's the all allegation. Uh, the total population of applications should have been assigned to the total population review teams in one randomized process. Explanation, we confirmed that um, that those assignments did happen a couple of batches. We had some time lags in, 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 in our process around reviewing applications for minimum qualifications and also getting conflict of interest statements from reviewers um, and wanted to still adhere to a reasonable timeline to get through the process. RFA compliance, this assignment of applications is not addressed in the RFA opportunity for improvement if we want to assign applications in a random manner we should wait until um, all applications are available for assignment and um, youth development should also make sure there's sufficient time to complete all the steps in the application review um, we are certainly looking and I'll, I'll say this now but probably a little more detail at application assignment and reviewers and all of this process given the volume of applications I think there are some big questions for us to ask um, and we don't, I don't want to go get into all the details right here and now, but, um, there's certainly some, these are really good points and, and we will work in our next process to address. Next slide. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll actually pause. Any questions or comments? Nothing from council members. Okay. Application scoring. Applications were assigned to different, to Three applications were assigned to two different review teams. Scores from two review teams were then averaged. Um, we confirmed that this did occur. Um, stated that this was not inintentional; it was an error, um, but that it has occurred in, um, in the past. Um, and scores were averaged when applications were inadvertently assigned to more than one team. Um, duplicate scoring and averaging are not specifically addressed in the RFA or in training. Um, so there is uh, opportunity here, right, for us to take steps to avoid duplicate assignments. Again, given the volume. Um, I understand the, the, the and am concerned and yet know that that there's some human error here. Um, but also, so we can strengthen the application assignment process. 
to reduce likelihood of occurring and also give consideration to if averaging scores creates a fairness issue for applications. Um, you know, one of the things around application, both review and scoring is for us to, given again, the high volume is maybe there's an opportunity for us to hire an outside contractor to do a bunch, the big review, right? So that our staff, which is not massive, is um, not having to, to go through all that high volume, but doing something with an external party would be at a cost, I'm sure. I don't know what that cost would be, but so there may be a thing, there's a place for us to consider how to do that better. Um, and that probably could give rise to some concern um, among community organizations about our reviewers representative, right? And are they from the communities um, that that where, where dollars are going? So there's going to be pluses and minuses, but certainly, um, yeah, real opportunity for us to, to um, improve that. Next area, contact with reviewer due to disagreement. Um, so the allegation here is that um, our ODE procurement uh, specialist contacted reviewer after one application score, um, about one application score, sorry, and questioned the reviewer's use of all zeros. Um, we confirmed that, you know, and I was in conversations about this when this did occur, um, about the fact that we had a reviewer who gave all zeros and included a note that the application should be disqualified because it did not meet minimum qualifications. ODE found this concerning. We wondered what we should do, and we did actually have an outreach with that reviewer, um, given the nature of what had occurred. Um, staff contact with reviewers is not part of the RFA and is not covered in reviewer training. I think this was, I can't say it was the only time, but certainly in my tenure, it was the only time that this issue has come up. Um, and yet again, real opportunity for, for improvement for us to consider the fairness and optics of contacting reviewers um, while the window is to open, establish some criteria for re reaching out to reviewers um, and when finalizing scores and an escalation process if there are concerns. So really good feedback and opportunity for us to not have um, that contact um, unless we have a clear process. All right, I'm gonna pause, take a breath. Anything up to this point? Questions, comments? Not seeing any hands online. Melissa, will you move us? Thank you. Two more. Um, uh, scoring rubric. Um, the scoring rubric resulted in inconsistent subjective scores not based on objective criteria and wide discrepancies between reviewers and review teams. That's the allegation. Um, our explanation that we've used a different rubric in the past, and this year we used a zero to 10 scoring rubric, which was actually provided by the Oregon Department of Justice, um, and noted that this scoring rubric could have resulted in a wider range of scores. Um, and yet at the same time, the zero to four rubric, as I understand it, also did give people the opportunity to do like half scores, like 0.5 or 1.5 or 2.5. So there are a number of options. I think overall, as you'll see in the opportunity for improvement, opportunity for us to, to, to refine and, and develop a better rubric. Um, our RFA does have a three or three page long evaluation section. I think in the hard copy of the review, there's more detail about what that rubric is and what the each of the levels is. So if you want to look at that, you can. Um, but again, um, we will look closely at the rubric this coming RFA to to strengthen that and improve it. Probably take out the zero um, uh, and and improve the rubric and share this information with the Department of Justice since that's where the rubric came from. The zero to ten. Now our different levels and explanations have certainly we can we customized. Um, so. That's that one. Any questions? Any? Yeah, I'm talking fast. No, Melissa moved it. It's all right. It's all right, Melissa. We're going to go to six. <laughs> Trying to go fast. Um, protest process. Allegation here is that there are no clear protest policy in the RFA, and scores and award statuses were not provided to applicants in sufficient time to include in a protest. Explanation Youth Development refers applicants to RFA, which does include a section on protest submission. Um, and, and we don't have the opportunity to provide scores in time for protests all the time. Those scores actually come from, um, I think the procurement single point of contact actually provides the scores. But I think, again, opportunity for us to clean this process up quite significantly. Um, I'll just read the compliance. No mention 
is made in the RFA about providing scores in sufficient time um, for use, nor does it state whether scores can be used as a criteria for a protest. Uh, Section 5.2 of the RFA addresses protest submissions. It states um, that an affected applicant has seven days. Um, so we should clarify the process um, uh, that whether or not we will provide scores during the protest period and whether scores will form the basis of or may form the basis of a protest. So again, real opportunity for us to improve this and clean it up. The RFA templates that we get from procurement and from, from um, ODE have not had a real specific um, um, policy around this. So we'll use this as an opportunity to, to clean ours up um, and again, share that with ODE and maybe they'll use some of that information in, in the other RFAs going forward. Any questions? comments. I'm going to breathe. <laughs> now, a few more slides, and then we'll kind of wrap this up. I tried to advance, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> you just do that. <laughs> I'm just like, you over who knows what's going to happen. Okay, in conclusion, this is straight from the review. None of the allegations represented potential or actual violations of the RFA. The RFA did not address most of the matters raised in the allegations. Next slide. Okay. Yeah, these are these ones are go fast. fast okay. So, um, overarching recommendations from the review by the third party, consider providing more details about the application review and scoring process in the RFA or supplemental, supplemental materials. Also ensure there's sufficient time to complete all steps in the application review. Next one. Okay, so now we get to kind of what we're going to work on and have been working on. Um, we debriefed with our grant staff in early December in 2023 to discuss and identify strengths and challenges. Um, I shared the, this review with our grant managers and staff um, within the last couple of weeks. So our full team has had the chance to um, look at this information. I'm presenting this summary today uh, at our meeting. We will continue in, to engage with grantees, unawarded appl applicants, and community stakeholders about funding an RFA process, probably more in the kind of like summer and fall. And we also want to talk to the YDC about this. Um, we will address the identified opportunities for improvement and consider ways to go above and beyond. I mean, there's some things that are very specific, right, around um, the protest process or the reviewers. And I think we were, we're going to take a step back and just say, okay, how might this process look in a kind of new and revamped way? Given the volume, given the interest, um, I'm committed to, to looking at all aspects of it, but also trying to think about this um, really holistically. Um, this full review and the presentation will be mail made available as a part of today's meeting materials on our website. Next slide, um, just some other kind of key points. We will continue to center our grantee and community needs for the clear for a clear and concise application and timely announcements of, of awards while not um, sacrificing you know all the process and procedure that the team will develop. Focus on continuous improvement internally, refining, ensuring consistency across our requests for applications. We have organizations that apply sometimes, as you know, for multiple grants, so we want that consistency. Um, we'll continue to collaborate with ODE procurement on the development of the RFA. Um, I think what I'd like to see going forward is working with uh, one of our committees and or our work group on RFA improvement. So, um, we'll probably, I think our plan is to go to the policy rules and research group and frankly, talk to other, other committees and say, Hey, are there members of, of this, of our, um, council who would like to be a part of a work group to work on the RFA? Um, and we'll provide updates at our meetings as we're doing today. And we'll come back to you in June with other updates. Um, we'll also conduct information sessions, um, in the probably late 2024, maybe early 25. Um, that are kind of pre-RFA, like here's what we're doing, here's what this looks like, right? I think it's a real opportunity for folks before, um, you know, before the actual RFA is public, but to ask us questions to understand kind of what we're going for. So we'll do those information sessions, I said, either later this year or um, early 2025. Um, that concludes that. <laughs> Um, again, apologize. I know I rushed through that. You have this hard copy. We'll put it on our website for those online. Give us to the conclusion of today's meeting and a little time to get the meeting posted. Melissa will get it up um, and you can can 
can look uh, more deeply and closely at this information, but wanted to make sure to take time today to run you through that summary. Um, just appreciate again, people's feedback and with the process, there's opportunity for us to improve. And we take that seriously. Appreciate the input from the organizations that, that gave us uh, that feedback. Also the individual, I'll say this because the report says it explicitly that it is a um, YDO employee who provided individual feedback. So we're gonna take all the perspectives and, and do our best with a, a new process. So that's what I've got to say. Anything, I'm not seeing anything in chat. I'm not seeing hands. I don't know if anybody else sees any hands, but Parasa has a hand up. <laughs> I really appreciate the overview of the main takeaways yeah. on the audit. Yeah. And then also just a summary of the commitment and next steps yeah. from YDO. Yeah. Something I was curious about because of knowing that some of the improvements are going to take time yeah. and sequencing. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can speak to the need for additional staffing capacity or support for grant managers, because that was the first thing that came to mind for me, knowing the volume and yeah. interest. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you're ready to share something on that, but I'd love to hear what's kind of the latest thinking of the need to add capacity to be able to support uh, additional elements of the process yeah. that we want to make sure yeah. are done really well. And I think the audit and the review here help provide some recommendations on like where refinement could be. Yeah, I I think as we get into um, the spring and fall around the RFA development, um, we'll get more specific. So I'll just say that. Um, we're also in the process of beginning to think about our budget for 25, 27. And definitely, I have ideas about um, <laughs> if if um, there are more dollars, for example, in the workforce area, future ready, right? The, the, more dollars there, we need to have per a permanent staff person and probably some additional capacity there. So um, given the vol not just the volume of the applications, but the requests for dollars, I I believe that it, that there's a good argument to be made that we could administer more money. Um, we'll talk to the governor's office and and then see if the legislature see if that's a real um, viable request. And but more dollars would certainly I think need to come with some more capacity or at least um, the ability for us. Um, the authority to add more staffing, right? Um, if we add, were to add any more dollars. And I think we are we will look internally at how how responsibilities are, are, are assigned uh, to see if there's opportunity to, to shift responsibilities that might free up some more time and space for RFA work or for development or implementation. And then I guess the last thing I'll mention, I said it around the RFA review, it may be too that we need to contract out for some portion of this so that it's not on the shoulders of this of a talented and smart and super capable um, uh, grant manager staff. And, and I'll, so all that's under consideration. Um, so we'll, I think more to come. Thanks for that. Brian. Yeah, that's a good, good question. The next couple of years, next couple of months. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? We're still doing our best to get on that thing, that board over there. Oh, things are getting closer. I'm gonna um, turn it back over to you, Mighty Stella, and uh, we'll go to the next thing. Try to get back on time. Thank you, Brian. We're just a little bit behind. <clears throat> Nice. What should I do? Uh, you can actually see you on your laptop. Oh, but you should probably mute. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm now you're all muted. Can you hear us now? Okay, online folks. Thank you. <gasps> It's 
All right, apologies for um, the technical difficulties again. Um, let's see, so the next item on our list is the State Advisory Group Update, Juvenile Justice Committee Update. Um, and there is a vote here, um, so should we check if we have a quorum? We do have a quorum, thank you. Yeah. Thanks for your patience on that. Okay, well, thank you, Marisela. So, for the record, I'm Anna Sikino, Associate Director of Development of Oregon. And what we have for your consideration on both today is the certification process for 30 day extended detention program. And Melissa, thank you for sharing the PowerPoint. And I will be staring at the screen because that's what the PowerPoint is, not the Disregard of this just back from everybody in the audience, but it's kind of easier for me to see here focused on the biggest group. So, uh, Melissa, if you don't mind moving the slide next time, thank you so much. Um, before we go into it, I promise there's just like four, I think, four slides here. So, <laughs> it's long, but this is the information so you can have. Some information can you speak up to make Anna? to make an informed decision today? And of course, I have here today uh, the members of the juvenile justice committee who took um, who put a lot of effort into revising the documents that we're here to discuss. And I see Molly is on line, so um, Molly will, will join me at any moment you feel like it, as well as the members of the juvenile justice committee. So. In a nutshell, what we're proposing for you to accept today is a process that is based on Oregon statute, which is ORS 419.453, that requires, a allows for a placement of juvenile in an extended detention program that has to be approved by Youth Development Council. That's why it's up for your consideration and vote today. So that 30-day extended detention program is a program different from what is usually happening in the detention facilities for the period of eight days. You can read the statute, that's basically what it is. So that was the fundamental, that was the beginning of the process, right? Melissa, if you don't mind moving this slide. Thank you so much. And then, under the statute, the agency developed rules to make sure that we are uh, following a process that is going to continue through the administrative rule. So uh, I just have a couple of brief things here. So it's a definition of an extended detention program that is a program offering services and activities that support one or more thera therapeutic goals for juveniles ordered by a court to be detained for a period of detention exceeding eight days. So that's, that's the key word here, therapeutic. So there is something needs to be happening, needs to be provided by the program to ensure that there is a therapeutic component of the service. That's what the trauma informed comes in and so forth. The extended detention program plan means the written rationale for extended detention program and an explanation of how a country will deliver the program in conformance with the minimum standards set forth in the rule. So on top of the rule, we are, uh, uh, so the Juvenile Justice Committee revised and approved on March 13, which was yesterday, we were here yesterday. <laughs> Many of us were in person, including Chair Rogers, to review a draft and certain changes were made to it, and we will talk about it in a second. Um, Melissa, do you mind moving to the slide? Don't you know what's in? But we'll find <laughs> <laughs> so it's what, the next slide also contains part of the administrative rule that the council must approve or deny. So this is again, this is the responsibility of a council. An extended detention program plan within 120 days of receiving the plan. So it's a very short period of time. Three months seems like a lot, but a lot, but it really isn't given all the work that needs to go into it. So with that, we're proposing the following plan. So the application is received and reviewed by the YDL staff and juvenile justice committee members. So that's where the clock starts ticking. Like the plan is submitted and received. 
and uh, the plan is actually the application form, which I will not sharing here, but that's what the committee reviewed yesterday and approved the final draft. Um, it really follows the rule, everything that's in the rule, and in addition to the rule, we added some policy uh, requirements to make sure that program respects and provides adequate and responsive services to cultural needs and linguistic needs of mm -hmm. children placed in standard detention program, as well as meets the needs of uh, LGBTQ plus youth. So those are <coughs> policy additions to the general requirements. Um, and if I miss something, please, council members, add to it. Anya, yes. oh, we have a question from Jeff Parker, council member. Can, Can you read it? Can I read that? Um, how many counties currently have extended program plan in place already? How many do we expect to apply under this new process? Oh, Jeff, you just read my mind. That's going to be the next slide. Okay. All right. <laughs> I appreciate the eagerness. I appreciate. Well, there it is. But before we could we go back yeah. to the previous yes. slide, we have not finished our <laughs> thing there. Sorry. So I just explain. I just want to take those few minutes to explain mm -hmm. the process to the rest of the council members. The application is received and reviewed. So that an application is lengthy. So we know, and what we've uh, adjusted in this new application process, we're not requiring people to send us copies of every single policy that the uh, detention facility has. We ask them to send us a list, like basically like menu of programs of policies that you have with the expectation that they will be available and reviewed during the site visit. So it's just like we don't need to read them before we uh, commit to a site visit. But we do require a description of the program. Why is it necessary in the community? What is the court role? What is the department role and so forth? And that's all in the application form. Uh, so once reviewed, and unless there are any questions that require immediate response from the applicant, then we will schedule a site visit. Again, site visit is conducted by a group of folks. That will be YDL staff. There is like a permanent member of the site visit is Sam Ko, who is also a council member, but he, without Sam, we will not approve a single program, I'll just tell you that. Because the educational component is extremely important because kids will be there for an extended period of time. So education is key. Uh, and then there will, be, there will be an offering to juvenile justice committee members to join during the visit as well as council members in general. So just keep it in mind if you're interested that that's an opportunity and responsibility that is yours. Uh, Program information and the site visits will be then reviewed again by the Juvenile Justice Committee to make a final, hopefully enthusiastic recommendation. I'm looking at Christina, that's her language. <laughs> uh, yesterday to the YDC Council to approve. Without the Council approval, the certification is not complete. Okay? So once that process is complete, we will write a memo on a video that I had will be signed by Brian and myself, sent to the applicant. I'm Kim Justin, with some additional uh, edits to our drafted like, the certification letter, which is really simple. It's the date to whom <laughs> the application submitted, reviewed, site visit conducted, council approved on that date during that meeting, and you're good to go for the next six years unless you're making changes. So that's that's kind of the process. It sounds simple, but there's a lot of stuff goes into it. And uh, Melissa, now we're ready for Jeff's slide. Oh, <laughs> Jeff's slide. Jeff, this is just for you. So, <laughs> so every six years, that's that. This is D. That's from the rule. An approved extended detention program plan submitted to the division for renewal. The council must reapprove the plan using the criteria set forth in subsection four, which is yeah, it's in, it's the application form. So currently we have six approved detention programs. 
and two of them were approved in 2018, the Shoes County and Josephine County. So that means that they're up for the approval process. So what we just described, they will pull I'll send them a letter. This time it's probably not going to be in the letter yet. <laughs> it's just an email saying that you're up for reapproval. So this is the process that you need to follow. So the shoots of Josephine will be happening this year. Uh, then next year we'll have to look at Young Hill and Douglas counties because their approval was completed in 2019. Then we will get a year off in 2026. And then in 2027, we will be looking at Lynn, well, it's Lynn Benton facility, but it's the Lynn County who houses the facility that needs to be uh, applied and Norfolk. So that's our plan for existing programs. Of course, any program that is currently functioning and have been certified and approved, they don't have to be applied. They'll just, if they don't want to continue the program any longer, they can just let us know that we're not interested, but they will have to close the program because it will not be legal to continue for that. So that's that's in a nutshell what it is. We will have a, a there's a possibility that Lane County will be applied this year, but they have not expressed their uh, intention in writing yet. So they're considering. So we, we don't know. So that's that's basically what we have. And now Molly, Christina, okay. Kim, Sam, Marie Seller, you were all at the meeting yesterday. I'm sure I missed something super important. I think Anya, you did a great recap. Yeah, yeah Anya. <laughs> I think you did a great recap and to move this along, I think I'm going to put a motion on the table and then we, during discussion, I have just a tiny bit, but um, chair, uh, I would move to accept the recommendations from the juvenile justice subcommittee for the 30 day extended application program. Oh, sure. Bill second. Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. So, any question? <laughs> Under discussion, I just I would like to say that um, this process was super inclusive. That we actually reached out to the detention managers and the juvenile directors, and asked for their input as well. Um, and they gave us some great feedback. And I feel like our real partners in this as we've kind of um, developed the application process. And also that we're that Anya and Brian were really um, responsive to the programs. Um, over the last 18 months who've asked for extra help in some certification and notification. So I just wanted everyone to know that it was a really inclusive process. Um, this is Parisa. I, I just had a couple of questions in terms of, um, as folks are pursuing the extension, um, I'd, I'd be curious what kind of, um, in your application review and during the six year period, what's the sort of check-in process to see what progress has been made um, throughout that that time in which they're able to operate for that six-year period? So it's not necessarily a progress made because it's still a 30-day thing. It's, okay. it's, a, it's a time span. It does not exceed 30 days. It's just helping the kid um, stabilize in her situation. So we're not looking at for outcomes. However, within the six year period, if a program is uh, considering significant changes to the program, if they're wanting to implement a new curriculum or change the type of use, for the lack of a better way of classifying, um, then they will have to submit a request to us to make, an adjustment. To, to make that adjustment. So, any major adjustment has to be reviewed by the staff and by council as well. It's just they don't have to go through the whole process, which is really lengthy and requires a lot of documentation. But yes, it can. They cannot be functioning without you know making any changes without our um, consent. Thank you for that. It was really helpful because I'm not as familiar with uh, sort of the review process or check-in. So it sounds like 
the entity would have to initiate uh, any changes to their program um, with YDO, and it would have to go through a process um, as well. Right. But it's also, uh, we have all the, if needed, we could schedule a site visit just just to check on how how program is operating anyway in the period the the other part though that goes on six. the other part person that's a great question and the other part is is this is just a piece of the next part that we'll be bringing to you mm -hmm. um relatively quickly and when i mean relatively quickly i think nine months to 12 is the detention yeah. guidelines mm -hmm. um, okay and so gotcha. there's other parts that get played in into this um, and how they kind of dovetail together. But for example, one of the 30 day programs may serve girls. If they choose to want to expand to choose to serve both boys and girls, um, then there would need to be an, a reapplication or a or a, a notification <laughs> that they're changing the the population to be served. But these this is just one piece of the bigger kind of kind of package that you're going to be seeing over the next few months. Guys, <laughs> right, picking up the okay. package. Molly, you did not take the box yesterday. I know, I need to <laughs> get the box. I need the box of the, the detention guidelines. <laughs> the box that I'm referring to is a box full of detention guidelines that were issued in 2020. And I'm not the case, so I don't know if you can distribute that. However, it, actually, each one of you can leave today with a copy of 2000. 20 guidelines for detention facilities. Yeah. So that's that's what's currently being used. But again, it's responsibility of YDO and Department of Corrections to issue, to, to develop guidelines, have them approved. And we involve a lot of partners in that process. So it's again, it's a, sounds simple, but it's really isn't. But it's also really, really important because that's what becomes fundamental to operating juvenile detention facilities in the state of Oregon. So there's a lot of responsibility here. Are there any additional questions in the room or online? I don't see any online. Ready for a vote? Ready for a vote. Zan Ogero? Aye. Eric Cardella, Harissa Chanrami, aye. Yoseline De La Garza, if you can, if you're online, if you can unmute to vote, please. Thank you. When aye. it's your turn, thank you. Jenny Glass, aye. Janine Hartley, Celeste Jansen, Robin Johnson, aye. Sam Coe, Kim Le, aye. Andy Leonard, Tabidi Lewis. Adrian Livingston. Aye. Christina McMahon. Aye. Maricela Ortega Guzman. Aye. Jeff Parker. Aye. Carlos Rodriguez. Oh, sorry, Carlos. Not You're ex officio. You don't get to vote. I'm so sorry. <laughs> like Whoops. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Molly Rogers. Yes. Uh, Diana Rojas. Andy Santana May. Janelle Theobald. Uh, Liz Thorne? Yes. Kiwi Wilson? <coughs> that is it. And that is enough to pass. Thank you. Um, so the next item on our list is data and research presentation. Um, I'll go and mold. Yeah, uh, I'll do a quick, quickest of intros. Um, Paul, feel free to jump in too, or others. But just many thanks to um, Bill and Molly for what you're about to hear and see. I don't think you have the hard copy in your packets, but you do, if I'm not mistaken, have two one pager data sheets. So you have the data sheets, but you don't have the PowerPoint. We'll make that available after the meeting and we'll show the PowerPoint here on the screen. Um, just as a reminder, this is um, data from the second half of the last biennium. Um, so we're sharing information specifically from our community investment grants. 
and our um, re-engagement grants. At a future date, we'll bring more some information about um, our future ready grants. So future ready grants um, are not in this presentation. Certainly get with future ready being um, a little newer, there, I think a little more time is, is good um, for us to spend. And then we can bring you that data at a future date. But I know Bill and Molly have been working hard. We've had a chance as a staff to see some of this information. And this, again, I'll say is like last year at this time in March, we presented you the year one data. And the year before, I think we presented data from the previous biennium. So we want to each year be bringing kind of this high level. A lot of this is um, kind of some of it is output data, right? Demographic data and how many youth and how many of this, right? So we're not as able, I think, given capacity and time and lots of other demands to say, okay, from this, we X, Y, this is going to have an impact on some other outcomes. But I think one of the things through strategic planning and through additional work and time, we can uh, use this opportunity to um, think about in, in our strategic planning sessions at a work group level. Like, so, okay, what, what, what story do we want to tell? But today is about education and information. So you have a kind of a baseline um, of the data from our community investment grants and our re-engagement grants. So I'll turn it over to um, Bill and Molly, or Paul, anything else? No? Just appreciate Molly yeah. and Bill for the work that they've done. I think, Bill, you're going to start us off? Yeah, thank Let's you. Do it. My name is Bill Hansel. I'm a grant manager and a data lead, and I will review our community investment um, uh, uh, what's that collective impact. Uh, still, um, <laughs> I have to check myself. Um, so uh, that comprises the the grant initiatives of Promise Solutions, Workforce, and Violence and Gang Prevention. Um, these are still, uh, uh, it's hard. Yeah, these are still preliminary results. It takes a while to finalize data, but it's, it's pretty close. Um, for this year, there were 96 grants total, 37 in Promise, 23, 31, and 5. Next slide, please. Um, of the 96, 88 were used in this analysis. Um, you can see the numbers went down in solutions by seven and in violence and gang prevention. The seven in solutions are aggregate data, so it doesn't, uh, doesn't fit this type of analysis. And I think the, uh, the one in gang is also reported uh, in aggregate as well. So I believe the only missing data is because of uh, uh, aggregate reporting. Next slide, please. So, Participation by um, initiative, 56% um, of all the youth. Um, on this, uh, let me back up, on this handout too, it's not on this slide, but on the handout, it shows that um, in the last um, year of the biennium, there were 6,800 youth. Um, and that's an unduplicated count. So about, there were, over 200 duplicate cases, which just means a youth add more than one um, service provided. So uh, it was a start and stop, and that can be for a variety of reasons. Um, there were 3,821, so over half were served, as you can see, 56% in promise. Uh, 1,690 um, in workforce, and that's about 25%. In solutions, there was uh, just over a thousand served. That's about sixteen percent. And then um, violence and gang prevention comes in at two hundred thirteen and about three percent. Um, next slide, please. Our average age. Um, again, this is by um, initiative. So the average age for uh, violence and gang prevention is 17. For Promise, it was 14.6. Workforce, 17.7. And Solutions, 14.9. So um, not, uh, I think those numbers make sense. The, um, the, the 
workforce is almost eight, averaging 18 years old. So that, that covers, as you would imagine, the older, um, older youth. Promise has the lowest, so um, uh, average age, because they're picking up our six to 14 year olds. Um, however, the, the mean age um, or mode is higher um, than that 14 point, uh, not the mean, but the, uh, the range. There's it bunches, they're, they're all um, quite a bit around uh, 14 to uh, 17 years old in that one. Uh, next slide, please. This is uh, the gender breakdown. Um, we use the, um, we follow the federal reporting standards, use female, male, and non-binary. Um, this biennium, we've added uh, an optional uh, column that will be able to pick up wider um, uh, terms, more inclusive terms, um, and um, so that's a, a nice advance we're making. But you can see that uh, females out uh, numbered uh, males about 50%, 44%, then um, non-binary youth are 4%, and um, missing is about 2%. So um, that's 3,413 females and 2,981 males, 290 non-binary. Um, let's go to the next slide. We'll see the gender um, breakout by initiative. <coughs> and um, interestingly enough, that, that uh, blue um, bar uh, is our females, the orange is Male, um, you can see that um, females outnumbered in promise by um, quite a quite a bit. They're almost 50-50 um, in solutions, and then um, males are actually higher in um, the workforce. And if you remember, the average age was higher as well. So that that likely means that we're uh, workforce is serving. Well, um, older older males. Uh, next slide, please. This is our uh, race ethnicity uh, breakdown, um, and um, I can't read that. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, I was like, oh, I, the uh, um, categories are American Indian, Alaska Native, Asian, Black, African American. Hispanic, Latino, A, uh, Latina, Latino, Latina, Latinx, um, Native Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, two or more races, and white. Um, the way the, the feds again roll this up is that um, two or more, the, the additional other categories aren't reported, they're counted as two or more. Uh, the caveat to that is Hispanic, Latino, if that is marked as the ethnicity, it, it carries over. Um, but uh, so uh, we did capture, um, alt we're capturing other races. So um, a little deeper dive, I'll be able to tell what races get covered up primarily by the two or more indicators. There have been concerns that that primarily impacts uh, Native American uh, um, youth and um, also possibly African-American and Hispanic. Um, so that'll be interesting to find out. Um, but you can see that um, about 36% of our youth are, are white. This is well below the student average um, and well below the population average. Um, then the next highest is um, Hispanic Latino at uh, 27%, which is um, uh, over a quarter of the youth served. Um, and then there, there, the other categories are um, relatively close together with um, African Americans comprising 14%. And 
the uh, Native American at 9%. Uh, yes? How do these percentages compare to the population of school age kids? Um, yeah, that's a good, good question. And um, they, if I have not, I did not yet compare those two yet, but I believe they are a little higher. Um, I would compare them not not to the general population, but probably to a subset like uh, non-completers or 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 youth that uh, 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 like from the ODD dropout report. Um, but then also that it's a little bit tricky because you have to break it out by the younger kids, which are you know comparable to the to the older, and there's different demographics and younger ages. Um, but like you said, the, I believe um, I believe um, white is um, at about fifty percent. Um, um, this is just going off the top of my head. I think um, Hispanic Latino is about uh, twenty percent. I think so. I think our numbers are are slightly higher, um, which I, I think we can interpret that that's because we're meeting uh, or um, serving youth that have. Uh, the highest need, and we would expect uh, that those demographics to be higher. Thank you. That's a good question. Well, and this is Christina McMahon. <laughs> um, Bill, I really appreciate that explanation and your comments on that. I, I looked at this and I was like, wow, I'm excited because historically we know um, BIPOC, youth of color have been underserved. So we're starting, we're starting with a disparity. Mm -hmm. So we need to be putting more resource into making sure those historically underserved communities are getting the extra help they need. When you look at data, I'm just talking about my own county, and you see the disparities with kids, for example, who recidivates mm -hmm. and who does not recidivate, meaning commits another crime. Um, there's higher rates of recidivism for kids of, of color. and. We're trying to figure out what do we need to what how do we allocate our resources to address this. So I'm looking at this saying this really reflects um, targeting, in my opinion. Maybe I'm just being overly optimistic, but it, it, on the face, it looks like we're doing a good job of making sure that funding and services are getting out to those historically underserved or um, communities you said who have more needs. I think is so. I think we're on the same wavelength, but um, so. This didn't concern me when I looked at it. I thought, yay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you. I, I would agree it's it's reflective of, of I think, the uh, indicating uh, reaching a, the target population. One, one that I will note that I think is quite a bit higher than the student population is our Native American population. I believe that's around 2%, and we're almost at 10%. So, that's Which right. color is that, Bill? That is the uh, under the kind of orange one. It's the uh, 6029 percent on the left hand side. Thanks, Bill. Let's move to the next slide. Um, the um, and, and the reason that that one didn't have a code was because I ran out of room and I on the sheet <laughs> it's on the next slide over. I think there's um, two, actually two or more races than oh, the uh, Alaska Man. Um, American Indian Alaska Native is 6%. 6%. Okay. Those blues. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Thank you. I'm just looking at the order they're in. Yeah. And that's yes. Like Excel tends to do it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, 6%. Still probably three times yeah. or I mean, twice as high. Um, and this is race ethnicity by initiative. Um, and the um, the Big um, surprise there, um, or just um, interesting finding there, is that um, Hispanic Latino uh, youth are um, a couple hundred higher in promise than any other category. So, so they're the most uh, served youth within, and I know what's driving that actually. Um, um, Adelante Mujeres in, out of uh, Hillsboro served nearly 2,000 youth over the course of the biennia. And so that's uh, 
Is that also why it's, it's um, more girls in that program? Yes. Yeah. 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 That's exactly right. <laughs> They're 100 percent girls. <laughs> Um, the, um, yeah, let's, uh, just go th through it. The, um, again, it's, it's hard to see. Um, and I have a bar chart. I, I kind of tried to split it up between, um, like show one bar chart and then on the slide, a, a, a pie graph, but the, um, uh, and of course now that code, the, the colors aren't combining with the one on my, that switched up the, uh, the color code. But, um, oh, and, and that's because it's, I think that's the, uh, the quadrants of the squares are, uh, I'm trying to figure out how that even makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't see where like workforce, yeah. like where the program uh, breakdown is, but um, I can just share that. Um, I might even got the wrong yeah. slide. But, that uh, Bill, the one on the screen looks like it's from Promise. It looks yeah. like it's from Promise. Uh, okay, but the colors did shift. Mm -hmm. so yeah, happens in Excel. Yeah, so I uh, uh, the one on the. Um, on the handout is accurate. Um, workforce had um, um, quite a, uh, almost three times as many uh, white uh, youth served compared to any other youth. Um, and the uh, solutions had about twice as many, um, just over twice as many. Um, and virtually the, the uh, Hispanic Latino population is either the highest or second or third highest in all in all um, initiatives. So um, anyway, uh, and so that that um, Adelante Mu Harris is only in Promise. Uh, so so um, there is some uh, good spread throughout solutions, particularly, and then workforce. Uh, yes. Thanks, Bill. Uh, this is Parisa. Something else. First off, thank you again for putting together this data. I think it's really helpful to get a better sense of the different investment grants and uh, the race and ethnicity breakdown. Um, the other overlay I was curious about was just thinking about the distribution of the community investment grants around the state, like um, across different counties. It's a wondering I have, just mm -hmm. thinking about the the youth were able to serve across different parts of the state and how that impacts like who we have represented in the data here as well. Um, so again, just a wondering. Yeah, it um, wasn't, like you're saying, wasn't covered here, but uh, Abraham often every biennium does a, a map. Um, so yeah. I think I've seen it before. Yeah, so yeah, so, yeah I'm working on it yeah, for that. So I think actually, I have postings, I think, already, actually, from last cycle. I think are on right now on our website, actually, I believe. But, um, yeah, 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 those are on. And, yeah, okay. if you go to a specific okay. section, you'll be able to find it there in the community investment or the re-engagement. I think it's all combining one kind of interactive map, actually, for all. I think the one that's not there is, I'm not sure if you're ready on that one, though. That's the only thing. I don't think we have to. Oh, but there's a map that you have. Oh, no? Okay, I guess I do. <laughs> <laughs> and I can, our, our grants are clustered in the I-5 corridor um, and primarily um, in the Willamette Valley, but then uh, Portland Metro should come as no surprise um, uh, as it's also the population center. Mm -hmm. And then um, and then we, kind of, we have some ebb and flows in uh, the eastern side and then southern Oregon is is pretty consistent um, um, but uh, yeah central Oregon and eastern Oregon are are um, have the fewest um, fewest grantees thank you for that I'll see if I could share the link with uh, Melissa here and then we can put it in the chat thank you we're uh, doing a style we may do should we just move and do the turn and talks after okay yeah I think we should this time is getting short. all right thanks Bill all right. I will pass it over to Molly. Okay, thank you. And so I think uh, Molly Burns, grant manager, uh, re-engagement analyst for the record. 
and I think Melissa's just going to queue up my slide. You do have the re-engagement one pager. And as Paul, I mean, I'm sorry, as Brian mentioned at the top, uh, we're just focusing on the year two data of the 21-23 biennial data. Uh, as Bill mentioned, this is a high level descriptive numbers. These are preliminary results. So this is where we are at today, looking at that second year of the data. So in our second year of the 21-23 biennium, we had 42 re-engagement grants. We had 10 collaborative grants uh, uh, added to the 32 re-engagement opportunity grants, which ran in the first year. Next slide, please. Um, if we... Uh, is that the good. next slide? <laughs> Sorry, I think there we go. Sorry about that. Um, if we take a look at who were our grantees, um, we did have five organizations which had both the opportunity and the collaborative grant. Um, but in our grantee pool, we had 19 nonprofit organizations, uh, seven of which ran. Uh, either alternative schools or in one case on the coast, a GED program. So they ran those re-engagement grants uh, in an educational setting. We also had eight uh, public schools. This could be a public charter, public alternative, uh, as well as a rural traditional high school in uh, amongst our grants running re-engagement programs. In addition, we had five educational service districts across the state, three workforce development boards, one community college grantee, and one community office grantee in the re-engagement pool. These 42 programs, next slide, uh, outreached to 4,500 youth in year two, and they enrolled over uh, 2,500 youth. So we're at 2,582. Uh, in the numbers I'm presenting today. And so one observation, uh, just kind of looking at these numbers, which might be interesting to explore further, is we did have a cohort of students who enrolled in both year one and year two. So that was between six to 700 youth. So that's an interesting group to look at. Um, another, another element that stands out is there was about 30% of the year one youth who did not complete and do not show up again in year two. So about 450 individuals. Um, to better understand those youth, to better understand how we at YDO can support those grantees with, with that youth population. So lots of questions in the data, not too many answers today. Just wanted to call that out. Next slide, please. So in year two, 425 youth completed high school. Uh, about 36% of those were GEDs. I think on your handout, 151 GEDs, 274 high school diplomas. So good work for all the grantees and all the youth out there. It's really exciting to see. And this was an increase from program year one uh, where we had about 320 completers. So we get to combine those numbers, which is super exciting. Next slide. In terms of the participation distribution by age and the re-engagement numbers, uh, looking at the known ages from 14 to 22 years, taken on the last day of the biennium, June 30th, um, we've got the distribution here. And you can see that 17-year-olds were the largest share. Uh, one point to point out in terms of age is 19 plus uh, combined was about 19% of the total share. And I think this is gonna be an important number to look at. This is before we updated the administrative rules and increased them to 24 years. So our grantees were only able to serve up to 21 and so I think this is something that we're going to be looking at uh, in this current biennium, see if we influence those numbers at all. Next slide, please. 
Um, here we have the participation by race and ethnicity. We're also using the federal categories. The largest share is non-Hispanic white at 56%. Second largest share um, is Hispanic and Lat or Latinx at 24%, and that can be of any race. And then you can see the other uh, breakdowns, and they're also in your handout as well. On this side, I did include the unknown, which was relatively small at only 42 count there. Next slide, please. Uh, breakdown by gender, and uh, you can see those numbers. <laughs> it's a small pie. <laughs> okay, so um, I have two more slides and just a little bit of context to these slides. So the re-engagement programs interview or survey the youth at the program entrance. And they're trying to better understand and then provide us a 60,000 foot view on what are the reasons for leaving school, for disconnecting from high school education. And then when we go to the next slide, what are their reasons for joining that re-engagement program? What's in it for them? And so um, go back to disconnection, okay. yeah. And so in this, for this year too, we already counted the year one last year. And so what I brought here was just the 1900 odd youth that just showed up in the year two data and what their surveys were. And, um, and so it's really quite uh, clear that the frequency of youth who claimed lack or who, who shared lack of academic support as a reason for uh, disconnecting, disengaging, and or leaving school. And so the youth are able to choose multiple responses in this. And so, you know, we see that lack of academic support, credit deficiency, so academic reasons for disconnecting <laughs> from school as well as the third month school social environment is also coming up in the top five okay um and we'll do questions at the very end because this is my last slide next please uh and so in terms of the top five reasons cited for entering uh we see a similar pattern of really talking about education mm -hmm. um the requirement for re-engagement programs is to reconnect to that high school completion but we're seeing alternative education setting as the top most frequently cited reason, followed by needing credits. And then the next two are really that individualized uh, work with the students, so the academic and career coaching and other individualized services and support. GED completion options made the top five. And if we combine high school completion options, um, it's actually going to put even those, those higher up in the data. So lots about academics here in the re-engagement program, perhaps not unsurprising, but it's coming out pretty clearly in the data. Um, so at this point, uh, I know we've got a question. We were going to turn and talk for just a couple minutes yeah. to your neighbor, or do you want the share out? I think we should probably do questions. Questions? And yeah, I think okay. I don't know if we have enough. Yeah, we lost time in the beginning, not your fault. Though. Brian, <laughs> just to add a quick clarification on the re engagement data. Yeah. The trends for you from the first year and the second year were pretty consistent, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Which is yeah. so the fascinating. Reasons, and then the, re the reason for disconnection and the reason for reconnection both years had very similar trends, different percentages, <laughs> sure, but different numbers. But the, the, the trends are staying pretty consistent for those reasons. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Christina McMahon again. Um, this data that was in the upper right corner, top five cited reasons for school disconnection. Yeah. So I, I think I know what this means, but I'm curious as to how this was defined uh, for the young people who were responding to this school social environment. Um, so in the 2123, it, it, I should I should step back and say uh, we've got 40 two different programs, different case managers, coaches, and um, in some cases, uh, the, the coach may be having a conversation 
with the student and just gathering some of these answers. And then it may be that person who goes in and then records it on our, it, on our records. It may be that in certain cases, um, we're seeing that programs are actually given, uh, giving those different choices for the student, the youth to tick mark themselves. Okay. So uh, just so you kind of understand, it's not like it's uniform across all 37 organizations. It can be a little different. Um, in this particular data set, we labeled it, uh, are we talking about the academic one or the social one? The social, social um, school social environment. So we labeled it social other in the 2123 and then defined it as school social environment. So anything social that didn't include bullying. Bullying was a separate Okay, That's down. what I, I was getting at because we, in my department in Clackamas County, we're doing something called the SBIRT screening, brief, uh, brief intervention referrals, treatment and services. And um, kind of the area that talks about that social environment, this would show up a lot as bullying. So I was wondering if this was oh. an indicator of bullying. I'm, I'm not criticizing, I just was trying to understand because my brain immediately went to bullying. Like, and by the way, we're seeing quite a um, high percentage of kids that are involved in our system reporting that. So, and also a high percentage of those kids who are reporting that are disconnected from school. So that's why it kind of caught my attention. Yeah, and I can give you the percentage on bullying. So it was actually quite uh, 94. It, uh, so bullying was cited uh, 94 times by 94 of the students as a reason for leaving school. Hmm. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is Parsa Chanrami, and thank you again, Molly, for the presentation. Um, kind of building off of what Christina had shared, one thing I was wondering about is, you know, as we receive this data, is there a conversation back to the school or the district where youth are coming from? And then my other wondering, um, this has to do with the data around high school diploma and GED earn. I also wonder if we're tracking youth that are on track to earn their diploma or GED, because these are completers, right, of the program. But I wonder if we have a sense of the youth who have been participating um, in programs that are funded by re-engagement, if we have a sense of like um, youth who are close to being at uh, the finish line, whether it's diploma or GED. Um, so those are just some of the questions that came up for me. Yeah, no, those are great questions. So for the first one, uh, we have re-engagement convenings uh, statewide and we share um, to date the aggregate data uh, at those convenings and talk about it. Um, and sometimes some trends that we're seeing are some things that we think the grantees are missing in the data that we um, will talk about that. And so maybe some definitions um, of some of the categories and stuff to try to get some more consistency across programs. So on that level, we share of course, they have their own individual data sheets, and they've um, and some of the grantees has, have expressed that it really helps them see their students in a different way, such as for uh, getting grants and things. Um, and so, the second question. Yeah, I'm just <laughs> I forgot already. No I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah, um, no worries. Um, I was just curious. Like, do we collect data on youth? that are on track to earn a diploma or GED? So it, that is a really fantastic question. And at this point, I can answer it this way, that uh, there are by Oregon law, uh, so by our administrative rules and the guidance that we provide, um, students, uh, sorry, the youth must meet eligibility for the program, such as uh, not, not uh, not being enrolled in high school, 
having uh, been out of school 10 or more consecutive school days. Um, we do have an eligibility where they can be on direct referral by a re-engagement partner. And those are designated entities such as a juvenile court judge. So we have programs that partner with the juvenile uh, justice system, um, OYA and other entities. And kind of that lowest uh, bar is a youth who is enrolled in school. Uh, they have to be at least 16 years of age. They have to have irregular attendance and be behind their peers by three or more credits. And so we've got eligibility stats, but we don't uh, collect total number of credits earned at enrollment in a re-engagement program at this time. Thank you for that um, a question of, about uh, the youth that don't stay with the re-engagement mm -hmm. programs and whether we have the same sort of top reasons for disconnection mm -hmm. from the re-engagement mm -hmm. programs. Excellent question. Uh, we've got, we can take a look at what we do have a little bit further. Um, programs ask, exit, mm -hmm. status, yeah. and you know, when exit is unknown, um, we also ask, they also have a monitor status where they're actively trying to continue to re-engage uh, um, when we ended the data on June 30th. So I think there's some rich information there uh, on that 60,000 foot level. And then we can have conversations with grantees to try to better understand their needs and their youth needs. Mm -hmm. But I would just say we don't. We don't know. We can even maybe crosswalk some data mm -hmm. in terms of, um, you know, disconnection from school because of work and family responsibilities. Mm -hmm. And if we're seeing that crop up again, yeah. uh, so lots of variables mm -hmm. and a lot of a lot a lot of unknowns at this point. This is Jenny. I have a question about the race and ethnicity data. Mm -hmm. um, so you know we were we were just discussing um that for the community investment grants and the numbers the percentages look a little bit different so i'm just curious is there uh is there a program that's really driving the the white participation i have not had a chance to look program by program and break it out so i do not know <laughs> just, it, yeah, it's I'm a great curious. Yeah, it's a great question um, to kind of dig, dig into that deeper, for sure. I wanted to um, comment on, on that too. I just uh, dug into the numbers and uh, Adelante Mujer served 662 of the 1800 youth are, are one program. Wow. Um, and so I think that just illustrates that um, on any given biennium, yeah, uh, if that one program wasn't yeah. funded, we'd yeah. see a big dip in, in, in that. Really doesn't mean another program wouldn't pick it up, but it's just, um, and I think that speaks to the, you know, the uh, nature of what a competitive grant process is. You don't, we, we could see mm -hmm. a big swing that had nothing to do with us uh, uh, in terms of who would, you know, uh, who we, Adelante Me Harris is still serving those youth, right? Like just not counted in our, yeah, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. if they weren't funded, for example. Uh, and then also the average age of all of the youth was 15 and a half years old. Mm -hmm. in, that, in that program? No, in all, yeah, all, in all uh, of, of the 6,800 youth, the okay. average age. And the range is 19 years, uh, which if you add six to, uh, mm -hmm. uh, is uh, takes you to 24 mm -hmm. and we serve. Uh, so that also just shows that the uh, that our services cover a, a 19 year age range. Uh, All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I know that we'll, we'll be able to dig a little, there's more you know, analysis that I you know Bill and Molly can do. We're at about 1147. So we were gonna do some turn and talk, but we, I think we're close, we're not too far behind. So what I guess I'd say, and my, my other self, if this makes sense, 
Maybe we have a time for a little break and for folks to grab lunch. Maybe for those in the room, if you want to turn to your neighbor for like a minute or two and just say hey and say hi and if there's something <laughs> from from the data that you have a question just have a little have a short conversation and <laughs> i'd say what by by noon that's by noon should we just by noon have your get, grab your lunch run to the restroom if you need to whatever come back to the table so again spend two or three minutes just chat with your neighbor um, and then you've got a, whatever, 10 minutes to bathroom, lunch. We'll be back starting at noon here. For those online, I think, yeah, you can, you can do what you need to do online. But for the room, we've got a few minutes, um, and then we'll be back at noon to try to close up the rest of the day. Again, many thanks to um, Bill and Molly. I know, Marcella, anything from you to take us to break? No. <laughs> So we'll see everybody online at noon. Yeah, yeah. Hello, everyone. It is Zoom, so we'll get started again. Cord on the route. Hello, Cord. Yeah, yeah, that guy. Get him, my fellow. Maybe she's not happy like every time. Are you going to try to go in the Oh, wow. And then there's also going to be birds. Welcome back, everybody online. My dad's cousin. We'll go ahead and get started with um, our strategic plan update. Um, and, and Cord will do that for us. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for the record, my name is Cord Buecher. I'm the Deputy Director of Youth Development Division. Um, and I'm going to give you an update on our strategic plan work. Um, two, two main things that this presentation will cover are the um, summary of our retreat that we shared by email with the council about a month ago. Um, hopefully, you've had some time to review that. Talk a little bit about that summary and then uh, also um, share uh, our recommendation, staff recommendation for how we keep this moving forward and what the next steps look like. Uh, next slide, please. Or do I? I don't have control of it, do I? Nope, I got it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, well, um, many of you were uh, with uh, together uh, back in November staff and um, members of the council uh, and some other partners <laughs> met and we reviewed the strategic plan uh, that we had um, adopted back in 2021, set priorities for the new one. Um, we had a number of different activities uh, that um, generated a lot of conversation, a lot of ideas. The staff collected, reviewed, discussed, and then consolidated all those notes. Um, and we developed a summary document that we shared with the council, as mentioned. Um, there were somewhere, I think probably about three dozen of those big sticky pages of, of notes. Um, we did a lot of work to try to really pull out the key themes. And of course, we did some prioritization and that really helped us. And so the document you got um, doesn't include every single thing that came up in the retreat, but it does try to synthesize it as much as possible and be comprehensive without um, having too much stuff in it. Um, next slide, please. Um, in that document, um, you could see things were organized in this way that is really just one way of looking at what we um, generated at the retreat. Um, we sorted all these different ideas and opportunities and priority priorities that we had into these eight categories. Um, they're not necessarily, I wouldn't think of them strictly as categories of work, um, but really more of the prevalent themes of the retreat. So, um, you know, for example, um, youth engagement, um, was a, a theme that probably weaves through different aspects of our work. Um, the, the council's role certainly weaves in and out of different aspects of the work um, around you know, everything from advocacy to our, our work around um, juvenile justice um, and, and the JGDPA responsibilities. So the themes are really the, represented here. Um, and that was just a way of kind of classifying things in that document that we shared. Um, Certainly, uh, you know, there's there's ways as you look at what's in that retreat that you might sort of see other other um, potential clusters of work or, or priorities. And that's something that we can um, look at as we uh, move this work forward. 
So I'll go to the next slide. Um, so we kind of want to just take a little bit of time while we're having lunch to just open it up for discussion. Um, we did talk a little bit at the Policy Rules and Research Committee about this document, um, but we'd love to um, open this up to council members in terms of how this summary landed with you, um, what may have been surprising, what resonates with you, something that you, you felt was missing that should be in there. Um, you know, and then there's some other questions here just to give you some some suggestions for what um, you, you might want to talk about. One other thing that um, we wanted to just keep uh, in, in, the, um, in the periphery is that in the previous plan, we had these three overarching goals that we used as a way of organizing um, all the different strategies in the previous plan. And so I wanted to just bring those back in just for reflection. As you look at all this, do those three goals still seem like they capture some overarching um, you know, themes as well? Do they, do they feel like things that we want to keep and find a way to connect back to what's developing from this retreat. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna gonna open it back up um, and give it to the floor for a bit um, for folks' feedback and thoughts on the summary that we shared. Mm -hmm. This is Muddy Feller, take it for the record. Um, I think the theme here is like transferring power to you, right? Like figuring out how to maintain your participation and engagement on the board. And I've seen that come up many, many times. Um, and that's been something that we've been trying to address for quite a while now. Um, one thing I really like that I seen on here is like the triple threat homelessness, behavioral, mental health, substance abuse disorders. Like a lot of those I think were were really important. And um, I'm glad to see that they've kind of moved up on our list of priority. Um, I was going to say, it looks like Mara said, you printed that. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I don't think you have a printout of those, but you have them electronically, I'm pretty sure, but I don't think you have a printout here in the room. We tried to put on the, the categories cord, we just put that slide back up. Um, this is Kim. Um, I'm very new, so uh, I wanted to say that the, this was the first kind of swap meeting. I had went to back in um, November, and like Marcella said, um, there was a lot of talk about youth engagement. Mm -hmm. And I will confess, the last two meetings I went, I remember Brian saying, hey, bring someone. Let's start making sure we bring someone. So I actually went as far as looking through my list of <laughs> clients and contacts and trying to find people who were you know, young and engaged. And I will say one of the things that I struggled with um, in deciding whether or not to make the call and invite them here was how how would how would this person feel like they participated in the meeting? Is there a place for their voice in the meeting? Is there a, a generic question that we're going to ask? At, and you know, let's say can we decide at this meeting? At next meeting, we would like to hear from the community about A or B. And at least then I could think, I'm like, okay, who would I want to invite to this meeting that could speak about A or B and feel like their voice was heard instead of, you know, this is my third meeting now, and I'm still like, oh, I, I, like some of the acronyms are getting better. I'm, I'm, you know, meeting friendly folks and stuff, but I feel like I'm being drowned in information. So how can I invite someone, make them feel comfortable when this is my third meeting and I'm still like, I don't know, and then have them... I have to tell them, hey, you're going to be recorded as well. <laughs> so whatever you share is like, you know, in perpetuity out there. So it would be really helpful if we want to bring youth into this conversation for us to have a space for their voice to be heard. And then to, to from there, kind of use that little seed and then slowly get them more engaged to the point eventually of having them having more 
youth in, um, in the council. No, thank you for that feedback. I think what comes to mind for me is the youth um, committee meeting, which we haven't had a lot of like adult participation in. And so everybody is welcome to join that. And that's um, welcome to folks outside of the council as well. And I think that's a really good starting point. Um, we have been discussing a lot of ways to um, keep youth engaged, but also um, like recently I reached out to some contacts at um, ODHS and the document that I sent them was an internal description of YDC responsibilities, which was really geared towards adults. Um, and so the folks at, um, I believe it's Foster Club, they had offered to kind of redo that document to have it be more youth focused. Um, and so um, one of the things we mentioned in our youth committee meeting was, um, you know, little things, providing notebooks to youth. Um, to take notes during the meeting, offering to hold those notebooks for them and give them to them at, at the council meeting, little things like that to kind of help them prepare for those meetings and stay engaged. Um, and so there's, we're working on some things and I think um, Abe will give an update a little later. Um, but yeah, that was the reoccurring thing that I seen um, during the retreat was like youth engagement, youth engagement. Um, and we have these goals. And so I, I just want to make sure that you know, we're using our contacts to, you know, let people know about this opportunity. And also, like you said, like, it's really important that we create space for them and try to help accommodate where we can so that they can actually participate. Um, because like, my experience on the board has been very similar where I'm like, oh, now I understand six, seven years later, <laughs> you know, and so I was listen to I'll speak up, Zana Ojero. I think that um, uh, all of you at, at the staff level um, did a, a good job summarizing all of that uh, massive material that we generated at the retreat. And the categories uh, make sense. I think the main thing that came up for me when I was reading through all of it is um, how do we prioritize? Uh, what, how do we really decide what um, to focus on? Because uh, if you look at the the, the eight categories there, uh, there's certainly overlap, but you know, um, not every one of them could be at the top priority. So what does it really mean? Um, but these, this is definitely a good um, summary of all the themes that came up. Sam, thanks for the comment. My, my audio, I don't know about other folks attending online, but my audio cut out during your comments, but I did catch that one of the main things that you, 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 your reflections was that the prioritization uh, of these is feels like the, the next challenge. Yes, I would say that's accurate. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I believe space for any other comments. And then um, I believe the slide or two slides from now, it'll talk a little about next steps and maybe even address some of the, the comments here. Hey, this is Brian. And, I mean, I think I think that yeah, I think I said this in the youth committee meeting. I think we need to do some fundamental rethinking, and maybe Abe will get to that in the youth committee update. But real opportunity to ask the questions, Kim, that you're asking, um, or to dive a little bit into how do we authentically and risk um, engage young people and the youth committee and there is a really important proving or I don't know space but I think your comment also makes me say and I lived about an hour ago I was like oh goodness we're just drowning you people in information but <laughs> we're really good at that um, and how do we even make this space just so that it's not the drinking from a fire hose right mm -hmm. and again we may not answer all of it right here and now, but do we need to meet more often? Six times a year versus four, do we need to have a longer meeting? For those who are newer, this council meeting used to be, I think, multiple hours, like a morning period where there was just more sort of, here's the information, information gathering, information kind of sharing, and then then in the afternoon, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, was more like the votes and the sort of, the, the, but it was like a six-hour meeting, yeah. if I'm give or take. I'm sure somebody could correct me. But 
I'm sensitive to wanting to keep you informed, um, but not overwhelm you and find opportunity for interaction and also time for getting the information you need to, to, to you know, make votes. So there's, there's things that we're bouncing, but totally is willing and interested in some maybe some fundamental maybe sort of some fundamental ways that we need to shift um, again and council members right how do you how do you want to engage so that you feel like this is worth your time and and also you're getting the information you need? Christina McMahon, um, I feel like in the, uh, I've only been involved, this, I've just had my four year anniversary here, um, for four years, but in the four years that I've been involved, and um, I came, so I don't want you to know, well, I came <laughs> from the system, right, and have a lot of crossover with stuff we're talking about in these acronyms, and I felt like I was drinking out of a fire hose when I first got here. So um, I don't think it's because you're not a government uh, person. Um, so I've often wondered. So so this this organization has grown a lot, and the I mean we just had the review of this RFA process, and you know four over four hundred applications, right? It has felt to me, and I, I don't want to get people throwing their lunches at me. <laughs> it has felt to me like, wow, this is really important stuff. There's great work going on. There's so many needs. There's so many challenges. Um, you know, whether it's trying to figure out the beast of the RFA or procurement, or yeah, you know, I mean, there's just so much going on. It feels like four times a year isn't enough. And I've often wondered, why aren't we meeting every two months? Because it stayed the same meeting wise, but it's really, really grown. And so that's what it feels like to me. And I've only been here four years, but I've been hearing about this group. I'm part of the Oregon Juvenile Department Directors Association. And, um, you know, for, well, for some years, Anya, you weren't there, but um, we worked with Anya closely and we would hear what was going on yeah. with um, this organ, you know, this group. So, I just, I, even before I was on it, it just feels so different mm -hmm. in terms of the, the breadth and all the, the different things that are going on. It feels like we need that time and that space to talk. And I know everyone's super busy, and I would not advocate for longer meetings because uh, as much as I, I like to be in person, I like to be able to, you know, I get my energy from other people. I don't really get the same energy on Zoom, but I understand the value of Zoom is that people who would otherwise not be able to be here or participate, we still get to have their voice. So that's really, really important. Um, but I think being on Zoom six hours is really insane. It's hard to do. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at my colleagues over here and um, Jeff and uh, it is hard to be on Zoom for more than two hours. I so I would not be an advocate of lengthening the meetings, but but maybe having them every, every two months instead. And I would prioritize that. But and I understand other people have other things on their plate, so I'm not speaking for you. But I know I think it would be a valuable use of time. I never leaving. I never leave. I just was saying to Kim, um, I I really am impressed with this meeting because there's so much care and thought and intentionality about making sure that we have information so that we can have meaningful discussions. I have never left this meeting feeling like, wow, that was a waste of four hours of my life, but I wish I could get that back. So, over on the other side is waving, kind of nodding in agreement with me. But um, I, so I don't know, those are just my thoughts, but I don't want to not be sensitive to people having a lot on their, lot on their plates. So. Uh, thank you, Christina. Thank, thanks everyone for your comments. Um, 
I that's a that's a great review. I think that we're not <laughs> wasting four hours of anyone's life. Um, <laughs> <you're today. laughs> um, and I see I think we're over time for this particular part of the agenda by a little bit. So I'm gonna um pause for 10 seconds in case there are any other comments, but then I'll move us to the last slide and talk about what we want to suggest for next steps. We can, or I'll say Brian Dutman here real quick for the record. I, I think in maybe in, a, in an executive committee meeting or in additional committee meetings, youth, et cetera, we could take the idea of more meetings, <laughs> more time or whatever we want to call it and, and maybe have some smaller conversations about it. So that I don't want to, didn't mean to derail us from strategic planning, but I think that's back to kind of one of those fundamental, like, well, let's, let's step back and say, how do we, how might we do things differently to, and then Christina, the scale, the new legislation that's brought in future ready and re-engagement, those were not things five, six years ago that were happening. That's not to say that there wasn't a whole lot of other complexity, but maybe an opportunity for us. This strategic planning, this, these questions we're asking ourselves, I think certainly give us an opportunity to, to do things differently. Great. Um, thanks, Brian. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I, uh, I could definitely um, see that being a policy rules and research committee topic, possibly. Um, the proposed next steps you, you should see now on the screen. Um, I mean, the first one actually came out of discussion at the policy rules and research committee. And Zan, I think it was a version of the comment you made earlier, um, that maybe the next move in general is just to start reviewing all of these bodies of work or themes and look at it again with our equity tool and assess both the viability and the sort of timeframes um, and priority of these goals in terms of what, what needs to be moved to the front of the line, um, what may have to wait, and how do we start to call this into something that um, we can really start to design action around. Um, to that end, you know, thinking about the best way to do that work with the council, um, we wanted to suggest the establishment of a um, YDC work group to participate in this process of reviewing and refining um, what we've got from the retreat and developing draft strategic plan materials. Um, this, this, this is suggested um, instead of just assigning it to a council committee for a couple of reasons. I mean, one is that a work group, um, you know, in the um, bylaws, a work group, you know, essentially is a little bit maybe more nimble. Um, it's led by staff, and, and I would um, propose to lead this one. Um, work group can just be created by the chair, um, you know, essentially um, uh, determining that a work group is necessary. It's open to anyone on the council. It is open to folks from outside, and, and certainly we could involve, um, you know, other voices as needed. Um, and the proposal for a work group would be to meet two or three times this spring and work, um, you know, work on this together and also independently. Um, between the end of this month and um, by early June to have developed something that we can then bring back to the council um, to then talk again at our quarterly meeting in June about where we're at in the draft plan. Um, the work group work would, um, I expect, continue through the fall or completion of a strategic plan. Um, so this would be a place, again, it's not something where if you want to participate, you have to be available for every single work group meeting, but just creating a space where any and all council members um, could just be notified of opportunities to weigh in, participate in uh, the development of the strategic plan, um, and then bring that work back to committees and to the full council periodically um, for, for review and, and for feedback. Um, ideally, this, this would um, also result in us keeping our timeline of this summer, being able to do some engagement um, with the community, with stakeholders, um, with our, our um you know, partners, grantees with tribal nations to refine this with outside perspective. Um, and so the next slide shows the timeline. Um, and so essentially, you know, I, I we, you know, we did apprise the, the chair of this idea, um, but wanted just to kind of bring this to the council and, you know, it doesn't require a vote, but just affirm with, with you that this um, feels like a good strategy for us to maintain momentum on the work of strategic planning to keep council involved, but also like have it work in a way that's more nimble and, and doesn't um, slow down other work that the council um, needs to do. 
Are there any questions in the room or online before we move on? I don't see any online. Thank you, Jeff, for your comment. Jeff Parker says the timeline looks ambitious but doable. Accurate. Thank you, Cord, for that um, update. Yes. Uh, thanks, Chair. So I'll just wrap by saying that um, we'll share more information um, about how folks can continue to be involved in the work following the meeting. That's great. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, so the next item on our agenda is the grantee spotlight Latino network. Jimena Ospina is um, the Youth Department Violence Prevention <coughs> Division Director. We also have Edgar Rubio, who is the Youth Empowerment, and Violence, Youth Empowerment Violence Prevention Associate Director, who will be providing a, a presentation. Some of you who attended the Juvenile Justice Committee meeting last month, I believe, um, uh, met them during that event, yeah. Thank you. Let me just make sure. Hi, Edgar. Are you ready to share our presentation? Yes. Hi, everybody. I'm going to share my screen. But before we start sharing, my name is Jimena Ospina. I am, I use she, her, hers, ella pronouns. I am the director for the Youth Empowerment and Violence Prevention Division at Latino Network. And today we're going to be sharing um, about our agency, about our JCP funded program, and um, then take some time to uh, answer some questions if you have some. So, um, Edgar, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, everybody. My name is Edgar Coya Rubio, Associate Director for our Youth Empowerment and Violence Prevention Division at Latino Network, and I use he, him pronouns. And yeah, excited to be here and um, can't see you all there in the space I, I can i can see christina sitting there in one of the corners so hi um so um yeah uh it's great to be here with you all again and let me make sure i click on the right thing oops one second looks like this is a preview okay ready given up And for some of you, you've heard this presentation a million times. So, Christina, please just bear with us a little bit. Uh, you'll get to new information soon. <laughs> uh, so, Latino Network. And so, we were funded in 1996 by advocates who saw the need of our growing community uh, in the Portland metro area. Today, we've engaged uh, nearly 12,000 community members every, every year through programs and services focused on education, advocacy, leadership, health and wellness, economic justice, youth empowerment and violence prevention, community building, and arts and culture. Latino Network currently provides direct services to youth and families across the Portland metro area in nine different school districts, and our services reach across eight Senate districts and 11 House districts. Our operating budget for Fiscal year 24 was over 21 or is over 121, uh, $21 million. Um, uh, we have 252 total staff. And uh, last uh, fiscal year 23, we uh, served 12,274 uh, unduplicated participants across 62 uh, direct serve uh, programs being delivered across eight community-facing divisions. We currently have presence in four counties in Oregon, Clackamas, um, those are Clackamas County, Multnomah County, Washington County, and an affiliate program in the Schutz County. And today we're gonna talk about the Youth Empowerment and Violence Prevention Division, which is the division that uh, both Edgar and I um, have the honor to uh, represent here and oversee. I 
Let me try to hold on a second because I lost the presentation here, Edgar. I see you all. All right. <laughs> I don't see you all. I think I can, I just need to scroll here. Okay, sorry. All right. The Youth Empowerment and Violence Prevention uh, Division is the Juvenile Justice and Violence Prevention uh, Branch of Latino Network. We, we bring over 12 years of experience <clears throat> implementing programs in the community in the areas of prevention, early intervention, case management, and higher levels interventions for youth and families impacted by the juvenile just, uh, legal system. Our division is the the first program at Latino Network uh, to successfully partner with government agencies. And we currently partner with all three uh, uh, counties surrounding the Portland metro area. That is Washington County, Multnomah County, and Clackamas County. At the center of our works lies the fundamental value of building trust in the community through the integrity of our programs and our dedicated team in serving youth and families of all backgrounds. Edgar, take us to the roadmap. Yes. Cool. At the moment, we have over 33 team members working across our region, from mentorship, credible messengers, case managers, diversion coordinators, family navigators, and peer parent mentors. Just last year, we served 1,300 uh, youth um, come to our services. For the last 12 years, we have been able to run the programs that serve youth and families at every turn, from upstream interventions with mentorship, mentorship programs and culturally centered activities like our ballet folklorico, to intensive case management and family navigation supports for those who are impacted by justice system or at risk of being impacted by the justice system. We have built teams of caring adults with a wealth of expertise, training, skills, but after all, deep commitment to uplifting youth, families, and transforming systems. Edgar, why don't you talk about our community-based diversion programs? Yes. So we'll be, in a second, we'll be transitioning into our community-based diversion programs. And we wanted to highlight some of these key elements that are true in these programs that we'll be sharing. One, we in our programs, we address the risk factors and needs Two, where we provide timely and relevant care coordination. Three, community-based interventions, restorative justice, and we're also culturally responsive. Um, these are elements that will come up in all of these programs, and we wanted to just highlight this before we dive into all of that. And um, one of the main things here is with our community-based diversion is it's timely and relevant. Jimena and I have had these discussions a lot, and it's like, when we keep looking back at the root and the foundation and the base of our programs and what we're trying to do is we're making sure that we're timely and we're providing relevant supports to the youth and family. So we wanted to share this just to kind of get us started into before we dive into the next section. All right. So we're briefly, Edgar, we're going to try to go really quick to make room for uh, questions at the end. Yes. Um, so talking about all of our programs with each county and uh, the first program, Chai Yai, and I feel like I will do a uh, disservice here because we have Brian and Christina here. So please correct <laughs> me and um, if I'm um, misrepresenting anything, but our uh, Chai Yai program uh, was uh, created in 2015, Bulnoma County Juvenile Department participated in the Georgetown University Center for Juvenile yeah. Justice Reform, the RED Certificate Program, the Reducing Racial and Ethnic Disparities Program, and invited a group of key, stake, uh, key stakeholders to participate in the development of a capstone project uh, for community-based diversion that was modeled after the successful Community <laughs> Healing Initiative Project. Um, since then, Edgar, if you want to uh, move us to what is um, what we've learned from uh, CHAI EI, the early intervention, uh, we've learned the importance of multidisciplinary partnerships. Uh, we've learned the importance of partnering with community rooted services, in this case, for CHAI EI, Latino Network, and POIC. 
We've also learned that upstream interventions and addressing risk factors at the earliest possible opportunity is the way to prevent uh, justice involvement. Uh, and we also learned that uh, we need to offer youth a wealth of services that are centered in youth interest and family driven. So um, we've used the program model and uh, the core components of the child early intervention as blueprint to um, offer and partner with uh, nearby counties, Clackamas and uh, Washington County. So why don't you talk really uh, quick about uh, the next two uh, counties, Edgar? Yes, we'll start off with our Restoring Individuals, Community and Hope Diversion Program. This is a rich program in Clackamas County in partnership with Clackamas County Juvenile Department. And I, I just saw Jimena's message yet, who I'll try to go and give all these next two programs justice without going too fast. These are really important to us. So we've been leading the Rich Diversion Program since 2019. And this program is uh, provides opportunities for youth who've had their first police interaction. So youth are repairing the harm they've caused in their community. They're getting connected to services in their community and creating goals that support their well-being. We ran a report just recently and since January 1st of 2023, to, to today, we've received 249 referrals and 86% of those participants that are eligible complete the program successfully. So what that looks like successful completion is youth are repairing the harm that they've caused in the community. That could be through community service. That could be through writing a, a letter of responsibility. That could also mean also being connected to supports in the community. So need, there's needs that arise around substance use, mental health, Youth are being connected to those services. And we going back to the, the term that we mentioned earlier, timely and relevant. This is what we're trying to, this is what we do in the rich diversion program. And as I, when I jump into the Rosa program in a second, um, that's really the, the key component here. So we're partnering with families, partner, partnering with key stakeholders in the community. You'll find our team at police roll calls, at school meetings, talking about our programs sharing and learning about make, learning about new resources in the community and making sure that we're um, connecting these families to the correct supports. As you'll see here, restorative justice practices and skill building opportunities for youth and parents. So I uh, want to make sure we're providing kind of that holistic support for not only the youth, but also the, the parents. Jump into our next one. Our ROSA program is our community-based diversion program in Washington County. And this is a partnership between Latino Network, Washington County Juvenile Department and POIC. We brought alongside POIC in the work that we do because we know the importance of making sure we have the right cultural fit and supports for our youth and families. And by bringing POIC alongside us, we've been working with POIC through the Community Healing Initiative work in Multnomah County and this has been a really successful partnership. So bringing them along with us in Washington County has been um, great for, for the partnership for us and also for, for the families to be able to make sure that they have the, the correct cultural supports. Something unique to the ROSA program is that we're providing these interventions to middle school aged youth who have been identified as high risk for system involvement. There's two referral streams, one through the Washington County Juvenile Department and through an our newly referral stream through schools in Washington County. That's one something that's really exciting right now. And we are, and the need is there. I think that's something that I wanted to, we wanted to share is the need is there. And this program is uh, being able to, to step up and support the, the need that is there. We have received since January 1st in 2023 till today is 106 referrals and 70% of the participants uh, go through our program, complete the program. Very similar to some of the, the values and pillars in Enrich. We're partnering with families, fostering relationships, providing those opportunities for skill building and also partnering. We have a new partnership with Working Theory Farm. Um, are out in Hillsborough, and this provides families with a way to connect, reclaim the land, youth can build some life skills opportunities, and we are also being creative on how to best utilize this partnership. So um, we're in the works right now, talking with Working Theory Farm on finding creative ways 
to really connect our, our fam families to the land, this beautiful land there, and also providing opportunities for, for healing. So I know I went through those two really fast, mm -hmm. uh, but we could take, last time we presented on these, we took over 20 minutes for, for each of these. So um, hopefully we'll have a chance for questions here in a second. Jimena, you wanna close us off with the Youth Promise Project? This is the easy one because this is not our division. So I just asked via email to our other director, can you share a quick update on what's going on with Early Escalera and our first sub programs at Latino Network? So uh, I'm gonna read alongside you so we can just <laughs> uh, share what's um, happening with Early Escalera. It's our, tenth, it's our su uh, support program for ninth graders and 10th graders with culturally specific mentoring and case management at Park Cross High School. And our first uh, program uh, is uh, the program that supports uh, graduated students uh, from Escalera programs. This is college and um, university uh, support for one-on-one uh, -on -one support uh, for students. So I think they did um, uh, four in-person workshops at Portland State University. They recruited 37 students. Um, and I would love to connect you all with Melissa because she has beautiful stories to share about your youth promise investments uh, mm -hmm. with the education access programs. And Melissa, I hope I uh, that we are okay with maybe taking one question, two questions. Sure. Thanks for checking. <clears throat> are there any questions? online or in the room you can you can stop sharing now edgar if perfect you... mm -hmm. yeah um i had a, a comment and a question uh this is parsa chan rami first off thank you again for the presentation today uh can you hear me all right Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you again for the presentation today. It was really helpful to learn about the programs and the impact on our youth. Um, one, one thing I was curious about as I was looking at the number of referrals for each program, for example, the Rich and Rosa program, I wonder, um, knowing the amount of referrals and then staffing capacity, um, what does that look like for you over the next couple of years and being able to keep pace with referrals and expanding the capacity of staff and the program? So that's a wondering that I had. I would say that's the wondering we also have. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, no, you know, honestly, I think this is a question we all have, right? Uh, but. Okay. I think, how do we really get more partners involved, right? I think in Rosa, specifically in Washington County, we have brought this question up to school districts, right? Uh, how are you willing to invest? Uh, same with uh, in with Gladstone School District, right? Like, are you really um, invested in this? And this looks like dollars at the table. So having these really tough conversations, right? Um, and I think we are now able to demonstrate uh, how this investment pays off. And so uh, with our um, outcomes, with uh, not just numbers, but really, um, really successful um, partnerships, um, showing how uh, we're making an impact. So I, that was not a like an easy one answer, one word question uh, uh, answer. Yes, this is an ongoing conversation, building relationship and demonstrating how this does um, is worth investing. So, um, yeah, bringing more people at the table, more more of those who can make decisions at this level at the table. So, any other questions? If it's okay, I'll just add um, that um, I think what makes these programs so unique is that they feed into one another. So for example, um, connecting with a youth who is starting to enter or at risk of entering the justice system and getting them involved in the education access programming, which um, uh, Jimena had mentioned um, the Escaleras program, um, but she didn't say the graduation rate for the youth going through the Escaleras program, which is 98%. So 
historically Latinos have a, a low graduation rate um, within PPS. And so like these programs on the juvenile justice side and also um, education access are really driving those graduation rates. And so I think that's what's unique is catching them um, early on, um, so as early as middle school, and then helping them kind of change their route, their direction. Um, yeah. Was that you, Marisela? I didn't. Me. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> I, I was also going to say uh, to add to that, like how we now have a wealth of programs, right? So we can step up and step down supports. So youth who are coming into our community based diversion, we can move up to higher levels of intervention, right? So case management, they need longer term support. They need a mentor. They need case management. So we can move them up. That comes funded through different funding streams, or they just need activity-based mentoring. They just need teen nights. They just need recreational activities. So we now have that mm -hmm. umbrella of services. So this is how we can uh, place youth at the correct level of uh, service, right? So mm -hmm. really, um, I think we've sophisticated our uh, intervention. So uh, this is also a way to um, diversify our funding, right? Okay, from many multiple sources. So, Marisol, yeah, can I just ask them? Yep. Um, Edgar and Jimena, can you just really quickly talk about HART, the HART program? I know it's not part of our JCP funding, but it's um, really one of those adjacent, and we go back and forth and and support people through the whole network of programs. So, if you could talk about that one for a second, that'd be great. Yeah, I can add a little bit too. And Jimena, you can add any more. Our HEART program, it's in Clackamas County in partnership with Clackamas County Juvenile Department. And this is providing services, family navigation to youth on probation. So we're receiving referrals from juvenile court counselors and our, we have a family navigator. The program connects um, these referrals to a family navigator who supports the youth and the family work on any specific goals and walks alongside these families to connect them to the correct supports in the community, right? Mm -hmm. Eliminating any barriers that that can arise when accessing services. And this could be, right, um, as simple as transportation or maybe fear or just confusion about how to receive services. Our HEART program allows or provides a family navigation piece and also provides skill building opportunities for the youth and the families. We have, um, we just completed a parenting group called Care Corazon. And we, some, uh, there was some heart families and some, so we're trying to create, we're creating this, this connection, this, this hub of families of parents that can come together and learn together. And we just created, we just finished our, our first cohort of parenting class of the Care Corazon parenting class. And there was heart participants in that. So we're really building community and building the, the capacity for our families to, to reach the correct supports. Um, yeah, hopefully that kind of summarized a little bit of what the heart program is. Christina, you can add to and Jimena, if I missed anything. Um, no. Yeah, it's, it's, it's to show the expansion and the needs and also the great partnership with Christina and your team of, again, seeing where, these levels of interventions and be able to provide the, the supports at those levels of, of the intervention. Thanks. I don't have anything to add. I don't want to make Brian's head explode. <laughs> 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 I know Brian well. Thank you, Hemena. Thank you, Edgar, for your time today. It's always great to hear updates about your program. Okay, it is 1248, so we're a little behind. Um, are there any members from the public who wish to make a comment? No. I have not seen any. Okay. Do we want to do a quick committee update or should we adjourn? Okay. Um, yeah, let's do a, a quick <laughs> committee update, just a, a few minutes. Um, policy rules and research committee um, hopefully provide a quick legislative update.
There's Corey. Here comes Corey. <laughs> My mouse was uh, asleep and not uh, uh, interacting. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna cover this very quickly. I'll actually uh, maybe let Parasa speak uh, to send off 1552 if you don't mind. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah, Do you want me to start? Ahead. Okay. Yes, go ahead, please. Thank you so much. Um, so Senate Bill 1552 um, is the Senate Education Omnibus Bill. It passed this um, last session. And one of the sections um, that's probably most relevant to our uh, council is it establishes a youth advisory group. And um, we, along with um, some student-led organizations, <coughs> Oregon Association of Student Councils, REAP, um, in working with the department as well, um, have been working on this policy for the last four sessions. And then before that, the Department of Ed tried to pass the bill two times. So six times in total. And it finally went through this session as part of the omnibus package. And so there are some provisions in it where the YD, YDO will be asked to work with the Department of Education to help uh, appoint and select youth to serve on this advisory group. And the goal is to um, ensure that youth around the state have an opportunity to be a part of the policy conversations at the state level. Um, and so I think there's a lot of complementary efforts um, with our youth uh, committee here and just thinking about how do we remove barriers to those opportunities um, and ensure that it's sustainable and we have representation around the state. So we are really stoked that that bill finally went through <laughs> six times the charm. Um, and there's still a lot of work to do to just kind of get things rolling as well, but it'll be housed in the deputy director's office at the department. Um, so that's who's going to start the work group process. And it'll take some time for the work group to establish um, like sort of what the plan will be for selecting uh, members of the youth advisory group, um, being able to refine what the supports look like for um, youth um, advisory group members as well. So really excited. Thanks for letting me share a little bit, Cord. Of course, thank you. Um, so I'll just very quickly talk about the others here. Um, HB 4802, summer learning, doesn't actually have any impact um, on um, youth development uh, division or council, but it's just great news that there's some additional funding for summer learning this summer. Um, and we'll you know watch to see what happens in 2025, um, looking to the future. Senate Bill 1532, Immigrant Refugee and Asylum Seeker Student Success Plan that passed um, as with the other student success advisory groups, um, this, this uh, legislation includes um, a YDD representative. Um, so we now have representation from the staff on all of the student success plans, and we'll have that on uh, on this one as well. Um, the last one, House Bill 5204. So this appropriation uh, is for the City of Gresham's um, East Metro Outreach Prevention and Intervention Program. This is something that um, the city of Gresham and particularly Representative Ruiz, whose district is out there, um, have, have pursued uh, in some previous sessions, they've gotten funding. Um, the division simply administers the funds. Um, so we're, we're really just um, you know, monitoring reports. You know, we're providing some technical assistance. Um, this project uh, got funded for $2 million for the current biennium, and they um, indicated they were going to pursue additional funding in the short session, and they got more than um, they had indicated they were going to ask for, so additional $2.5 million, so that's $4.5 million uh, for this current biennium through, the, um, through June of 2025. Um, and so this program is managed by the city of Gresham, but they essentially fund community-based efforts to um, work with youth, usually through culturally specific organizations, other CBOs, um, to help connect with them and steer them away from um, violence and the justice system. And this additional funding is, as I understand it, gonna even expand programming um, further west. So right now they're serving East County and serving some of Portland as a result. And this will probably result in more services further into Portland, as I understand it, all the way to 82nd Avenue. So um, just a um, substantial investment in trying to address prevention of youth violence um, in East, East Metro. So um, that's what happened in the short session as, a, as it impacts us or is of interest to us. 
Um, if any other folks have other bills that you want us to tune in, uh, you know, that, that have passed, um, please just shoot me a message um, and uh, we'll make sure we're paying attention and, and working on implementation as needed. Um, let's see, I see something that Bethany just uh, put in the chat, HB4082. Oh, interesting. All right. <laughs> I like that perspective. Is that um is that is that four eight oh two or is it four oh eight two? Is that a totally different bill from the one I mentioned? It's the same one. Sorry. Got it. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah, we love being in stakeholder groups. That's good news. Thank you. Um all right, I'll pass it back to um pass it back to the chair for the next update. Thank you. Um, and then I'll pass it to Abe for the youth committee update. Yeah, for the record, uh, Abraham Magana, grant manager and operations analyst. Uh, just to give an update, we met uh, last week uh, with the youth committee and we finalized our brainstorming session. In the previous uh, meeting, we had a brainstorming session. And this finalization of the brainstorming session, we identified some areas and things that we can be working, begin working on this year. Um, and I'll just name some of the things in regards to getting transportation figured out what that could look like, um, exploring the idea of informal youth gatherings and relationship building between the youth and or council members, uh, reviewing onboarding processes as well as kind of what recruitment looks like. And with that also developing and kind of disseminating the, uh, what would be an interest form of sorts for youth to be on the council. Now, having said that, those ideas, there's a lot of things that will be, it'll be an ongoing process because we will also have to discuss amongst ourselves, but also on our end internally, right? Kind of the details, the capacity, and what that actually means as we decide to, as we get and start digging into this, because I think we're gonna get, there's gonna be little things that we're gonna have to figure out as we go along. And I think what came out of that group really out of that brainstorming session and is there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, a lot, and I think to make sure that it is our processes are structured in a way that is accessible and welcoming for youth to be involved and actively participate. So, but that's kind of where we're at right now. And I don't know if you want to add anything, Brian. I know Chris has the meeting. Uh, for, yeah, Brian Devin, I, yeah, I just concur. I think we've got to, I mean, you, we just, as we're sitting around and the engagement is just not happening. Not, not that at the committee, the young people are fantastic, but I think we've got some. And it's the this new bill and the, the youth advisory committee, some of the same questions will come up. And so there's just, I said to the committee that I attended, like we need to fundamentally shift what we're doing. Um, and that's gonna take some time and some resource. So that's another part of the conversation that as we look into the next session and how do we, how do we get resources to really support youth voice and youth engagement to to work with folks like the wonderful Janelle who's here and I think you know you know you're kind of I mean you're the I don't know what I am the senior, <laughs> the senior member of the senior <laughs> elder <laughs> 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 wow <laughs> I know elder youth anyway I'll stop thanks yeah, and I'll just mention, um, Marisol Ortega, for the record, I'll just mention that the youth um, committee, we've, came, we've come up with many, many ideas, right? Like, and I think right now we need to create some sort of a tiered system. Like, these are the things that we need to do right now. Um, so, like, you know, increase communication and check-ins and, and things like that. Um, Abe is planning to create a Google form for folks to easily sign up or share the document, um, creating, like, easier, more, like, appealing documents for you to look at um and so those are some of the smaller things that we want to do and then there there were larger things like being more involved in the state advisory group and being able to you know attend or present at the youth um the cjj youth summit um that's been something that has come up over many years and we haven't done it um but it's still on the table and i don't think it's like going to happen anytime soon soon um but we the youth committee has aspirations to be more involved in that. Um, so, and I don't see any questions online. Let us know if you have any questions. Um, was is anything from you, Abe? No, that's it. Okay. Cool. Thank you.
you. So the next um, committee update is the equity and disparity. Do we have any comment? From hey, good afternoon. For the record, Jeff Parker, Youth Development Council member. Um, I've got a hard stop at nine, so I'm going to give you the five sentence update from uh, the Equity and Disparity Committee. We met in February. We set the schedule for the rest of the year. We are shamelessly recruiting new members and looking for a permanent uh, chair and co-chair. And we've begun looking at topics for the committee to work on going forward. Some of the suggestions include racial ethnic disparity work, tribal funding, and other topics. And we just wanna make sure that our work integrates with the work of the other committees and the larger work of the division. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank the amazing staff who support this committee and all the work that we're doing. So thank you a bunch. I'm happy to answer questions, but I got to split in about 30 seconds. <laughs> no questions. Thank you so much for that update. Best update. And we do not have public comments, so there's... there's Sorry. Maybe I'll just spend another 30 seconds. I know... We're at one o'clock, so I know some people may maybe get, you know, start packing up and moving. But certainly, takeaway, key takeaway for me is this conversation about whether we can add an additional meeting or two. So more to come on that, just so that we can have real space for engagement and um, among all of you in ways that are meaningful. Um, in particular, our younger um, members. Um, just some other quick things. I am excited about the fact that. At a YDC level, I think, and thanks to Melissa and other team members, like stipends are going to those eligible members um, so that they're, we're compensating them for their time um, through an attestation process in the, for 2023 and 2024. I think Melissa has sent out information. All of you need to fill out this attest, it's called an attestation, attestation Self form. Self-attestation Self form. Self-attestation form. So if you haven't done it and you don't know what I'm talking about, <laughs> Hmm, maybe either check your email or ask. I'm actually, I'm going to say I had it ready to go during this meeting. So you? we have everyone's attention and now you can check your inbox. Okay. okay. <laughs> yes. 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 <laughs> now, everybody's, you'll be looking out for an email from, from um, Melissa. We're reimbursements, I think, are for parking and for time at all sorts of, hopefully that's happening. I don't know if there are things that we want people to sign or do, Melissa, while we're here. Uh, if, yes, if folks can stay after, who, if council members can stay after, then yes. Yeah, so for travel um, or parking, check in with Melissa after. We do need to work, now that we have some new members, I'm aware from an orientation standpoint for Kim and for Jenny and um, Yoseline, um, we'll get that going, so more to come. Um, and we have some new candidates, certainly continuing conversations, uh, potential youth, another younger member, so, uh, even though, yeah, I love to write these like super dense, you know, documents and so my sellers comment about like how do we make it youth friendly? I you know, I could I need we need help. Um, <laughs> so we'll take that. Um just some other quick exciting fun news like there was a employee engagement survey that ODE did and does for all of its employees um or all employees sort of associated with the department. It's something that other agencies do but um, I can't, I'm not going to quote specific results, but I know that um, YDD Youth Division staff, um, we came out with some really exciting numbers about youth engagement and kind of, or not youth, employee engagement, employee um, um, sort of set job satisfaction. And um, so we have some good a baseline of information to build from in terms of what people um, appreciate about working for the division. Um, and I say that, you know, if you pre-pandemic, I think there, my understanding is there were certainly some questions um, among staff that were, that had come through a survey that the department and the union had done. So it was just exciting to see now, however many, four or five years later, I guess four years later, that, that some of those you know, staff engagement, staff satisfaction numbers are improving. Um, so that's some good news. Um, we, as a staff, did a suicide prevention training session with Liz Thorne, and she's not on anymore, but through Matchstick Consulting and one of her um, co-workers, another facilitator, so it was 
just important and I think um, significant that our staff came together and learned about suicide prevention. And, and so we'll think more about ways to, to engage council members in that and how we engage our, you know, our, our grantees and, and other partners and stakeholders around that. But it was just good for us as a staff to have, again, that kind of initial information kind of have this sense that before we start taking things out to the field, it's important for us um, internally to, to um, understand and adopt some of those ideas. So that was really good. And then a little plug, I know, I think Bethany was on, but the Boys and Girls Club has a um, event the next Thursday for their Youth of the Year event. And so we had some staff, we have, I'll be there and other staff are. So there are community events happening, you know, fundraisers and community events and that's so that's just one if somebody else has another one i'm not trying to show preference i do happen to be a judge for that youth of the year process so that'll be interesting to participate in so that's the wrap up i know we're a few minutes after appreciate um you being here any questions comments yeah fast and furious Maricela. and with that our quarterly council <laughs> meeting march 14th is adjourned you know, oh, for you. Yeah, I think you have a little time, but it's good result. Oh. Oh.